Thank you so much to the Creative Mornings team. We've been members and fans for a long time and it's a great honor to speak. And if there were ever a topic that speaks to us, it is language. Which, of course, is most fundamentally a form of communication. <clears throat> I knew I was gonna lose my voice today. Um, that communication takes many forms. So a painting, Guernica, employs a language. So does a photograph, Ansel Adams. So does this conversation between Aziz Ansari and Matthew Shaver, <laughs> um, as well as computer code, physical gestures, facial expressions. These are all kinds of language, right? They're all used to communicate. But of course, being who we are and doing what we do, Katie and I are here today to talk specifically about written English language and we just have to use visual and spoken language to communicate our ideas about it. So <clears throat> now I, for one, am fascinated by the evolution of spoken and written language. We all know the main rules about written language, some of which you probably treat as gospel, and some of which you may be cast aside, either because you just don't care, or you don't know any better, or maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> Um, but the rules of written English are pretty deeply ingrained, thanks to English teachers everywhere, but they can evolve over time like anything else, in my opinion. After all, language is wily, it is frisky, it is fluid, it is malleable, it's never static. We are constantly shaping it, and it in turn is shaping us. And you need look no farther than the common colloquialisms of the past five years to see this in action. I do think that a side-by-side -side comparison with Victorian English would be pretty interesting. Um, but in fact, it sometimes seems that as a culture, we are moving pretty swiftly away from written language to a more visually based one. But be that what it may, I'm pretty sure that written language ain't going nowhere. And we are pretty adamant about its value, not just as a basic tool of communication, but as an artistic tool of expression and exploration. So in support of that idea, here are a couple quotes by two of my favorite writers. In her essay, Why I Write, Joan Didion famously said, I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see, and what it means, what I want, and what I fear. And in his essay, also titled Why I Write, the great Southern writer, Barry Hanna, said, I write, was that a woo? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> also, <laughs> I write out of a greed for lives and language, a need to listen to the orchestra of living. So what you have here are two really different ideas at work, in fact, two different takes on the power of the written word, and we'll say more about that in a second. But first, Katie's gonna tell you a little bit more about the Center for Writing that we launched two years ago this month. Because creative writing is our jam at the porch, I'm going to veer left from the topic of language for a moment just to tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do. Once upon a time, not very long ago, Susanna Feltz here had an idea, a very good one. It seemed to her that with the growth in Nashville's creative community and all the exciting things uh, that have come with it, that our city sorely lacked a home base for its writers, a literary center, the likes of the Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis or the Lighthouse Writers Workshop in Denver or Grub Street in Boston. As all good ideas ideally do, the idea of a Nashville Center for Writing took root and grew, and in January of 2014, just two years ago, the porch exploded into life. Its smattering of offerings opened its website live. As a fellow member of Susanna's writing group, I had the good fortune to hop on the raft with her and hang tight for what has proved to be quite a ride. So what is The Porch? In simplest terms, we're a nonprofit literary center. Here's a slide of our mission. It's kind of a handful, but 
end, or a mouthful, I should say. Um, but in short, the port strives to foster Nashville's writers and literary culture through education, events, and community. So let me unpack this. I'll start with education, as that's really our mainstay. We offer workshops in fiction, poetry, creative nonfiction. Our classes have varied from multi-week courses and topics as general as, for example, the foundations of fiction, or as specific as the music of language, or exploring Nashville through ekphrasis. Ten points if you know what ekphrasis means. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, come on. Sure. No? <laughs> Ekphrasis is uh, basically writing about art. Am I describing it? Yes. Yeah. So, um, it's a big word for a very idea. <laughs> I was going to offer a free <laughs> donut in the back of the room for whoever knew. <laughs> Somebody knew it but was shy. Um, we also offer uh, half day workshops called craft intensives. Things like getting started, uh, dialogue and scene, narrative poetry. And then we have some outside of the box offerings, things like yoga for writers. So while Suzanne and I teach a number of the workshops, you can see from this slide that our instructors are as varied as our classes. So education workshops are largely what we do, but we also host literary events. We try to have an event every month, so with being two years old, We've had ballpark 25, too many to list. But some have included, that was uh, our recent December juried reading, uh, Poetry, which was National Poetry Month and Earth Day, Litter Scary, <laughs> Hamlet there, that was our Halloween party this year. Um, Twice a year we do a weekend Rivendell Writers Retreat up in Swanee. There's no picture, but the picture wouldn't do it justice. It's just beautiful. Um, the Literary Death Match, which is beyond description. <laughs> Our annual Heartbreak Happy Hour, which is coming up this year on February 21st. Uh, we had a big fundraiser last year, Tale of Two Tims. That's uh, Tim O'Brien is the National Book Award author of The Things They Carried, and then Tim O'Brien, who is the bluegrass superstar. Um, it was quite a night, and uh, we were really concerned that we would have a hard time topping that, but as Colin mentioned, um, this year we've got Rodney Crowell and Mary Carr on February 6th, which is next Saturday, and yes, this is a plug. <laughs> But if you think these events sound fun and interesting, well, they are. And that's the point, or at least part of it. The byproduct of what we do is that we are building a vibrant literary community in Nashville. In addition to education and events, we've also done outreach with several organizations serving at-risk youth. We believe that creative writing instruction serves not only as academic enrichment, but also a means of creating self-reflection and expression. And finally, the last thing I'll mention, this year we launched a youth program, SLANT, Student Literary Artists of Nashville, Tennessee. In fact, we're making history tomorrow night with our first SLANT reading at Parnassus Books. So that's the porch in a nutshell, but so what? To some, creative writing sounds frivolous, perhaps even antiquated. We think not. Yes, so enough about us. We think, in fact, that creative writing can make everyone's life better in a lot of ways. So let's start by going back to Didion's idea of writing to discover what she knows. In fact, a lot of writers have said similar things. Flannery O'Connor voiced an almost identical idea. She said, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. Sounds a lot like Didion. Um, which leads me to the idea that writing is, in its essence, a form of thinking. So when you sit down to write, you're often not actually translating thought into written word. You're creating the thoughts. You're honing them. You're coming up with them with the tools of words on the page. Writing understood this way is not an end product. It's not the result of critical or careful thinking. It's a crucial part of the process of thought itself. 
And so the more we strive to put our ideas into written words, the more we actually have ideas worth sharing. And the better we know ourselves, and the better we know the world around us, and the more able we are to think critically with clarity. I am personally motivated to write, not because I feel that I have something really important and gorgeous to say, damn it, but because more often than not, I'm pretty confused and overwhelmed by everything happening to me and around me and everything that I need to make sense of. And so distilling all of that chaotic input into written language is, for me, one of the best ways to make sense of it, to get a grip, and to gain clarity. So who can't benefit from clearer thinking, clearer knowing? Similarly, I'd like to argue that it's not just our own thoughts a writer comes to know, but the thoughts of others. By this, I mean empathy. A big study came out in 2013 that spawned lots of press. Reading, especially of literary fiction, makes you a better, more empathetic person. It makes sense. When you read, you become other. You know what it's like to be someone who is not you. And if you read a lot, that's a lot of other people, other experiences you've channeled and absorbed into your own self. I'm going to make a leap from that idea to say that if reading about characters who are not you creates empathy, so too does writing about them, whether it be through fiction, nonfiction, poetry, songs, any kind of imaginative writing that leads the writer to inhabit some other. As I'm sure you've all experienced, the way strong characters come to life is a kind of magic. For the writer, that's hard work, but it's magical work and very satisfying. I like this quote. A writer begins by breathing life into his characters, but if you are very lucky, they breathe life into you. I'd like to share an example. I'm currently working on a novel in which the main character is keenly attuned to beauty, way more so than the average person. It's almost an affliction because it makes her strange and disconnected. Among her fixation are trees, almost like she sees people in them. I've been living with this character for a while now, several years, and I too have become fixated with trees. I might see, for example, the caretaker who bends politely over the path, or the proud woman in Superman pose, or the quiet couple whose trunks grow in parallel. Walking through Centennial Park, which I've done for years now, I'm suddenly bowled over by trees. We hear all the time in inspirational literature to pay attention. I've learned it from my own character. So in this example, I illustrate two ways in which my writing has enriched my life. Empathy and attention. Good writing requires both. Creative writing also thrives on the made up, the invented, the fantasy, the dreamed up answers to what if. And as such, it's one of the easiest ways we have to keep our imaginative minds alive. All you need is something to write on and with, and you can exercise that muscle <clears throat> that is constantly flexed by children, but which often, too often, atrophies in adults. Of course, I'm talking to a room full of really creative people today, so you guys aren't really the ones who need to hear this, I know, but bear with me. Um, it's worth revisiting the role the power of imagination plays in creative writing. The creative release that comes with flexing the imagination can be really freeing and really refreshing. We all have the power to make stuff up. We always had it. We just have to tap into it. And when we do, it's often ridiculously fun and liberating. I get a kick out of seeing, um, this is the work of my seven-year-old daughter. She does what kids do with little effort. She makes up stories, and her stories, she's really especially into comics right now, as you can see, remind me to let loose in my own creative work and to not be so stuck on mirroring reality in what I write. And so in Talia's world, golden retrievers protect her from menacing black bears, and girl, and girl wildcats gobble up boy mouses and literally become fat cats, victory. Um, I think maybe she's working something out. I think there could be some victimless revenge fantasy happening here. <clears throat> but 
that's all to say that maybe there is a, dare I say the word, therapeutic quality to writing imaginatively, to taking fears and passions and doubts and beliefs and dressing them up in different clothes on the page. So who knows, maybe dreaming up fictional stories will save me some trips to the shrink or it might keep me out of jail. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> a word about stories, as stories are close cousin to imagination. Here's a quote by Philip Pullman. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need, we need most in the world. We hear about storytelling lots these days in the language of branding and how we sell ourselves and our, and our businesses. But what of the deliberate act of making up stories, of telling truth by telling lies? We can read about a plane crash in the newspaper, hundreds dead, and we feel sad, a little. Or we can consider the story of a single traveler on that plane that day who may or may not even exist, what she had for breakfast, how she kissed her husband before leaving, how she packed her suitcase, or what she packed in her suitcase, how she'd been feeling a little sad lately and wanted only to stay home that day. We begin to know her and we begin to care. And in making up, in the making up of this woman, we have truth that can be felt in a way the newspaper was unable to deliver. So critical thinking, empathy, attention, imagination, story. Perhaps a point to end with is beauty, the aesthetics of language. Written words are as basic to our days as food and air. But why settle for basic and essential? Why not strive to make the language we write zing and sing? In my formal, former life, I was a high school English teacher, and I often got the cocktail party question. Do you find your students are less effective writers because of all their texting and Twitter? Answer, yeah, sure. In fact, the National Endowment for the Arts came out with a study a number of years ago that reading is at risk among students, and with reading at risk, so too is writing. But no, I don't believe that readers and writers will disappear into extinction. But maybe raising a Tolstoy out of the average high school kid who's glued to his or her smartphone is less likely in this day and age. I don't want to be doom and gloom, but it's worth thinking about worth considering how to fight the good fight. Maybe we need to start a movement, a revolution of good writing, even in emails and texts, striving for language that zings and zings. So some final thoughts to wrap this up. First again with a quote from a great writer. This is one of our favorite things to talk about at the porch. Margaret Atwood's words that a word after a word after a word is power. This is from a really great poem of hers called Spelling, and you can find that online. You can also find the Joan Didion essay, Why I Write, online. You can find the Barry Hanna essay, Why I Write, online as well. Just Google it to use a common phrase. Um, one of the ways that we've seen words upon words upon words equal power um, ourselves has been in the way that sharing writing with others creates and strengthens community. That's a big part of what we do. We believe that writers need community. As Katie mentioned, it's one of the main ideas behind the idea of a literary center, period. Uh, we also think that writing can be used to create a larger sense of community. So, one of my recent favorite examples of this is a project that we started last September called Poetry on Demand. Um, we were asked to be part of the Neighborhoods Resource Center's weekend festival in September. And the idea was simple. We had a booth. People who stopped by were invited to tell our poets. We had five or six poets lined up. I was pretending to be a poet that day. Um, they were invited to tell us a favorite story about a neighbor, past or present. And then our poets would listen, ask some questions, dig for details, and then we'd take 20 or 30 minutes to write a unique poem based on that story. And then we gave the poems back to the people who told us the stories. And I have to say, the look on their faces when they heard those stories translated into poetry was just amazing. They got a total kick out of it. As you can see this guy right here, he was great. Um, <laughs> so luckily, anybody know Tony Gonzalez? 
Yeah, Nashville Public Radio. Yes. Anyway, Nashville Public Radio's awesome reporter Tony Gonzalez was there that day. And he actually did a story about the Poetry Demand project right before the Southern Festival of Books. So we again did the Poetry on Demand thing at the festival, and it was so much fun. And again, I really like to continue this at other venues and maybe even put together an anthology of the poems. So stay tuned. Um, we've recently launched another community building project called the Lit Mag League, uh, which is actually the brainchild of Katie Foster. Um, she is a Vanderbilt MFA candidate. And she, this fall, was enrolled in a class called Creative Writing and Community at Vanderbilt. So Lit Mag League is basically a book club for literary magazines. And it gives aspiring writers the chance to read a full issue of the kinds of magazines that they would be submitting work to. And in turn, it gives the writers who are published in those magazines more of an audience. It gives them more of the readers they hope to connect with by publishing their work. So it's community building on several levels. And I'm happy to report that it's been a runaway success so far. Uh, the January and March meetings sold out. And we've just opened registration for the May meeting at which uh, the attendees will be drinking wine, of course, and discussing Tin House. I also want to make a quick mention of the many wonderful community-based reading series that um, are going on in Nashville all the time. So in fact, just tonight is Lyrical Brew at Barnes & Noble the Van on the Vanderbilt, well, not the campus, but the Vanderbilt Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's a really great monthly poetry reading series. There's also Poetry in the Brew, which happens monthly at the Portland Brew in East, um, East Nashville. There's East Side Storytelling, Chuck Beard's uh, twice monthly program of story and song. Um, our good friend Kate Parrish, I just happened to see her back there, is reading at the, uh, the next East Side Storytelling, that's next Tuesday night at the Post in uh, East Nashville. It's a really good time. Uh, there's the revision series that started up last year at Stone Fox. Um, they're going to have to find a new home because Stone Fox is closed, but um, they'll still be going strong. And then there's Poetry Sucks, Chet Weiss's program. That's just, an, that's just a few. So there's a lot going on around town beyond us, and we encourage you to look up those events and attend them. And finally, whether you want to write or not, never doubt the power of a good book, because Books are not going anywhere, just letting you know. And if you do want to write, reading great books can teach you pretty much everything you need to know about writing. You don't really need us. I mean, you do, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the spirit of flexing imaginative muscle and community participation, I hope to send you guys off today with a little wordplay fun that uses a page from one of my favorite books, uh, The Liar's Club by Mary Carr. Um, the pages are back there at the table where you see on the wall erase your poem. So the idea is really simple. You take a page of writing from any existing book and you just black out all the words you don't want to use in your poem. And you leave the ones that you do. And voila, you have an erasure poem. Um, people do these all the time. There's actually published books of erasure poetry, so it's a, it's a thing. Um, so we invite you to make your own erasure poem, and if you like what you came out with, you can take a photo of it and uh, tag us, uh, Porch Erasure, language, CM language, on the old social medias, and we'd love to see what you come up with. So I want to thank you all for being here, and we want to especially offer a word of very warm thanks to our friend Dapper Alex Tapper, who's a porch board member who helped us a ton with our slide presentation today. Um, thank you also to the Skillery for being our home. And uh, we're happy to take questions. Do you see participation from the songwriting community about the events that you have where, say, Roger Brown was involved or Can you take that? Um, we were kind of advised early on that there is so much in Nashville for its songwriters that that was a territory that we just best stay clear unless we really know what we're doing, and we don't. Um, and so, except for the events, like bringing on Rodney Crowell, um, we've, we've kind of, yeah, kept our hands off of songwriting, although we wouldn't mind uh, trying, trying it when the time is right. Do you see a lot of people coming to you uh, trying to write novels these days, or are people trying a lot more short form stuff? 
That's a good question. Um, right now we have uh, actually classes in both. I'm teaching a class called Writing the Novel. It's a 12-week workshop, um, so people have come with their novels in progress. And Susanna is teaching a class called Writing the Short Story. Same thing. Um, uh, people, both, both. Probably not even. Probably more short stories than, than novels, but. I don't know. Um, I mean, I just feel like we get a lot of emails from people who say, I really want to write a book because I have this really amazing thing that happened to me and I want to share you know, what I've learned from it with others. I've heard many versions of that, which is awesome. <clears throat> but you know, I often try to push those people towards first writing some shorter things and getting a handle on their material before they actually try to write a full book. Um, so I think when people think about writing, they immediately jump to the idea of a book, of a novel or a nonfiction book. And I think it's really important if you have ideas that you want to write about to consider actually the short form that um, it's a good place to start. So we definitely get both. Both classes fill up really well. So um, it's just kind of my two cents on it. Alex? Logistically, logistical question. When y'all are writing, do you use a pen and paper, laptop, personal writing stuff? Just out of curiosity. Well, I, um, <clears throat> I write on a laptop pretty much like from the start, but I have been trying to branch out and write uh, longhand as well, kind of as I'm going, because I find that it's a different thought process. So I'm trying to do a little bit of both. And I definitely do both. I find that there's a more intimate connection between my brain and my pen. And so when I get stumped on the laptop, I have a notebook that I immediately go to. So I think it needs to be sort of a fluid, organic um, cross between the two. Yeah. Kate. So starting a nonprofit <clears throat> is a huge undertaking. What are some of the challenges that you've experienced over the last two years, whether that's legally or socially or, or anything? Um, I would say that for me, and maybe for Katie too, although she's been really a master of the nonprofit world, just learning to navigate the, um, all of the sort of paperwork and uh, everything that goes into starting a nonprofit, period, which doesn't have as much to do with, with the writing side, but just the business of a nonprofit has been a huge learning curve for us. We both are writers. I've been a freelance writer for years. I've been a teacher for years. So I was you know, coming to this with no idea of how to, how to structure a nonprofit. So that's been a huge learning curve. Um, but you know, the Center uh, for Nonprofit Management here in Nashville has been a huge help to us. We've taken a lot of their classes. And uh, without, I mean, I think that's just been, that's a great thing. So if you're thinking of starting a nonprofit, I would definitely check them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, funding is the biggest uh, challenge, particularly most grants aren't, um, you're not eligible until you're a few years old. So we've had to be pretty resourceful about um, becoming sustainable. And I think we're, we're, we're getting there. So. Um, you mentioned the idea of using um, language um, as a way of articulate, or not articulating, but a way of creating and refining ideas, mm -hmm. as, as well as a way to articulate or express ideas. Um, is there a process that you use for that that's helpful when you sit down and, and you're using writing as a tool for generating your ideas or refining right. your ideas as opposed to just trying to express them? Well, I would say that the, the only the thing to keep in mind there is that bad writing or messy writing is incredibly important as a, as a first step. So to not be afraid to just write the most god-awful things down on a page and just literally words, phrases, repeat yourself. I don't care. Nobody has to see it. Um, that's kind of where I start, say, when I'm doing an article, like a, a freelance piece. I'll just start by throwing random phrases and ideas on the page. And eventually, I'm going to work those into actual sentences that make sense. So bad writing, messy writing. That's your number one step. And I'm, I'm a big fan of free writing, which is basically like probably timed free writing to say 20 minutes, the pen doesn't stop. There are no rules except for the pen doesn't stop and just sort of forces um, those ideas out. Uh, 
Um, so I have this, this novel called The Color Wheel that I think is completely fictitious. You know, it's about this character who grows up on a commune in Oregon. I mean, nothing about it is, is like my own life. And my father read it. And I made that uh, comment one night. Oh, I mean, isn't it amazing how nothing is about me? And he said, bull. <laughs> he said, you're in every character in that book. So I think even if we try to not, to, you know, disguise our own lives, sure, it bubbles up because we're writing out of our own experience. Um, I have been revisiting some stories by George Saunders. I'm teaching one of his stories in my workshop right now, and so I started looking back at 10th of December, his most recent collection, and he's just, nobody writes like Saunders. I mean, he gets compared to Vonnegut a little bit, but um, he's kind of the modern day Vonnegut, I guess you could say, but he's different, he's his own thing. So I would, I would definitely say him. Um, I really enjoyed, a, this was several years ago, but it always comes to mind when people ask me this question, so I love to plug it. There was a novel uh, by a writer named Bonnie Jo Campbell that called Once Upon a River. Uh, it came out several years ago. I reviewed it for chapter 16, and I just thought it was the most wonderful novel. It's kind of like a contemporary female version of Mark Twain, but that's not really doing it justice. But she has a new book of short stories that's just come out this fall, so I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, I think the title is something about mothers tell your daughters, something like that, mothers and daughters. Um, how about you? We both read this book, City on Fire, that yes. will scare you if you're afraid of a long book. It scared me. Um, but uh, it's a 900-page book set in the 70s in New York City with just this wild array of characters, and it interweaves their lives back and forth. The guy's a genius. He's 36 years old. It's his uh, debut novel. He got a two million dollar um, advance on it, so it's it's there's a lot of press about it. This is this guy's going to be the next American Dickens, so I'd recommend it. I mean, it's <laughs> I, I yeah, I'm so glad she mentioned that because I got to say when you know we heard about it and the book the book um, reps were really pushing it. And my, you know, I'm a little bit of a cynic sometimes, and my first thought was like, oh God, you know, this guy in his first novel and his 900 pages and whatever. But um, I had a copy and I read the first 10 pages and I was absolutely hooked. And I, I've, I mean, I never read books like big fat. My, my husband, who's back there somewhere, he is like the big heavy novel reader. I'm usually reading like the typical mini, mini medium-sized novel. And um, I, so I read that book in like a month and I just absolutely loved it, it was amazing. I highly recommend it. It's so full of life. Um, just a plug for a, not a book of essays that I really re liked recently. If you're an essay reader or writer, um, Megan Dom's Unspeakable collection of essays. She put out a collection of essays in, about 10 years ago called My, My Misspent Youth. That's also amazing. And um, so this is her second full collection. And I think it won the national. It won some big. She won a big award for it recently. But it's she's funny and she writes on pop culture and. She writes about herself, of course, and it's really great. I think we have time for like one more. Yeah. Um, with self-publishing so readily available now, are you finding a lot of writers choosing to do that, and are they having much success with that happening? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and neither of us are experts on that subject, and we're pretty clear with people that we can talk a lot about the craft of writing. Um, and then we've, we've had the Paths to Publishing panel, and we, we have a, a great gal, Jennifer Chesack, who teaches a class on self-publishing. Um, but that's certainly a viable route um, toward publication. Yeah, I, I mean, I am not an expert on self-publishing, um, but I do think that the game has changed tremendously. So yeah, a lot more people are choosing to go that route rather than trying to find it. They're not even trying to find a traditional publisher. Um, they're just saying, I'm gonna put this book out myself. And some people are having a lot of success with it. And I think um, in making that decision process, you really have to do a lot of uh, educating yourself on everything it entails. Because for the book to be successful, you have to pretty much take on every single role of all the people at the publishing house that would have been working with you on the book. 
or else it just you can put out any book you want, but you know for it to be read by people is another thing. So it's it's a lot of work, um, but there are more opportunities, more ways to do it now than ever before. And for the right kind of book, it can be an amazing amazing way to to get it out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you.